ANC for cardiac surgery or um, you mentioned the risk for 30 up to 80% mortality. Even more, yeah. Even more yeah. so in child C. So, yeah. And it's a low number of patients. Yeah. It's a very low, low, lower number, number of patients. We have, um, for, for, young, for younger people, I have a woman, the, the young lady with a primary biliary cirrhosis and uh, a valvular, um, valvular uh, heart disease. Uh, you want to help this patient, but she's in so bad state, you can, you, the risk is to, to kill her, you know, and we have not a lot of, for a young woman, you have, we have not a lot of, uh, of good uh, alternative to give her. For, for the, the cabbage, you can do off pump. Uh, for the, the steno, uh, for the aortic valve, you can do TAVI, but for the mitral, you know, it's just like this. It's difficult to help those patients. So we have to go to more understand the physiopathology of the disease. We have to uh, try to correct all the uh, all what we can do, but in, in such a patient, it's very difficult to help her because she was not drinking. She has no uh, C hepatitis. You're just limited, you see. Thank you very much. Uh, these four talks are ready for discussions and questions. We should try to get most out of it uh, with practical issues. Um, Thank you. Yeah. De La Baïs from yeah. Lausanne. I have a question for Dr. Meyer. Uh, what is the role of the, the tips in this patient uh, uh, with cirrhotic uh, cardiomyopathy? Did you have any experience because you increased the venous return? That's right. Um, actually, maybe we should ask Dr. Semela because I don't have, I'm not an, an expert in that field, but I've, I've read some papers preparing the, this presentation that you're right, uh, TIPS may increase the venous return and may precipitate heart uh, failure. But was, what is the thera therapeutic role, you mean, uh, of uh, TIPS in these patients? I, I don't know, honestly. So maybe we should ask this question to the gastroenterologist. Well, um, actually, I don't have experience in patients with cirrhotic cardiomyopathy and TIPS. But TIPS in general, in, in placing TIPS is usually in conjunction with bleeding from varices. And from time to time, we have the problem that they decompensate because they have a increased volume being shunted directly to the right heart. And the next step we do is to um, lower the diameter of the TIPS and to reduce the shunted volume, paying the price of higher portal hypertension again. But uh, this is not an established therapy, TIPS, in cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. And every patient that is evaluated for TIPS, irrespective of the indication, needs to have an echo of the heart, especially focus on the right heart, to determine those patients that are at risk of right heart decompensation after TIPS. Because it's 25% of the cardiac output flow through the liver. And I mean, if, if you have half of the portal vein flow going directly through the tips to the right heart, some patients will decompensate. Uh, just a comment, because we, we have an inverse experience in Lausanne, just one patient with cirrhotic cardiomyopathy and LV dysfunction, which is quite rare, and refractory ascites, who really evolutes uh, very nicely after tips. He normalized his LV function and never had uh, uh, recurrent ascites over two years now. So I think it's still something we don't understand very well. Yeah, but this patient had left ventricular failure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So while we are waiting for the next question, I would like, uh, I think we need to have the, a common language. Now we have a, a little bit, uh, uh, we jump around that the MLD um, score is probably that what we should use, but three of the speakers presented results on the child score. Um, what do we? Uh, what is the advantage of a new scoring system? Perhaps Dr. Semelta. 
So, um, I mean, it's always difficult for a new score to, uh, to be established. So the advantage of this score is that you don't have three categories, A, B, and C, but you have uh, um, numbers going from 6 to 40. So the scale is much finer, and you can really allocate um, statistically the survival probability to each point. So you have a, a finer scale. Um, the other advantage of the male score is it's um, objective. So in the child classification, you still have presence of encephalopathy. So it's difficult, you know, most patients are tired. Is, is that already grade one or grade two encephalopathy? Um, it's difficult to judge. And the other uh, subjective component is ascites. So the patient, for instance, has a little bit of ascites or the patient has no ascites but is on diuretics. So how do you classify that within the child score? Because ascites is another component where you give one, two, or three points. Therefore, the MEL score based on creatinine, INR, bilirubin, is based on one blood draw and is much more ob objective and uh, gives you the, the finer scale for uh, graduation. Because you saw, you know, a child B can be, have 10 uh, or 11 points, which is completely different from a child B, seven points. So within the child B class, um, the stratum of the patient is very wide. Yes, please. Tobias Rutzow, I have one question. Uh, the uh, creatinine is part of this new score, but in heart failure, if you have an activation of the the uh, cardinal uh, um, axis, you can also have uh, elevation of uh, creatinine. So is this really, has this been uh, investigated in patients who have heart failure, who have uh, increased uh, impaired renal function uh, due to heart failure? I think it's Stefan. Can you can you repeat the question? Yeah. I didn't get the whole thing. So what what's the? I, I mean, you have increased creatinine. You can have an increased uh, creatinine level or in renal impairment due to heart failure. So in addition to uh, 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 in patients with heart failure and liver dysfunction, can you use this ML uh, score? If this, uh, if, if this, if the creatinine is actually, can you distinguish whether the creatinine problem or the increased creatinine is due to heart failure oh. or liver uh, dysfunction? So I think in these patients, probably the score, a patient with liver dysfunction and heart failure. I'm not sure whether you can, dis whether you can use the score, probably. You know? or is no, it, you, been, has you cannot, been within the score, you cannot distinguish. I mean, serum creatinine is serum creatinine. Um, you cannot distinguish, but I mean, if the kidney function is reduced, it's certainly unfavorable in terms of prognosis for these patients, irrespective of the cause. Most of the times in cirrhotic patients is hepatorenal syndrome type 2. So, uh, I mean, very slow but steadily decline of the GFR in these patients. Um, there's one problem. I mean, females usually have lower creatinine levels. They have a lower mus muscle mass. This score is being used for the patients to be on the liver transplantation list. So the higher your MEL score is, the higher you are on the transplant list. And females are in disadvantage because they have lower creatinine levels, although kidney function is the same or as worse as in the males on the list. But um, for this reason, they get less points and they get less often transplanted. This is one problem that is not solved yet. Uh, Dr. Meyer, a very practical question. In, in Geneva, do you have any recommendations for your surgeons when you want to have a, operate, a patient operated with liver cirrhosis to the perfusion protocol? So you go more for, let's say, in um, cabbage patients for off-pump, like beating heart surgery, or do you have any other requirements, what, what you want to have, let's say, perfusion pressure, um, uh -huh. Actually, again, to be honest, uh, I'm not the one who gives um, uh, advices to anesthesiologists for, uh, for uh, cardiac surgery in these patients. So I'm not really, um, uh, honestly, I, can, I cannot uh, answer this question uh, fairly. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Rusha maybe has uh, something to say about that, but we, I, don't have, I don't make recommendations in Geneva for uh, surgery in these patients. 
Good, uh, one of the hallmark of this syndrome of reduced liver function is anemia. Perhaps you can ask, uh, answer, uh, if you start with a hemoglobin of seven, what is the goal for surgery? That's, that's, really, that's a good question. So it's, we never start with a hemoglobin in this that low. So that is one of the problems. But if you have this low, this low level, I would go for cabbage, I would go for off-pump surgery. So this is yeah. really so that you don't have even more dilution. So um, I would go for pulsatile flow, let's say, so off-pump um, uh, revascularization. But I mean, if you really have a, a severe liver cirrhosis, I think we are getting really less patients for cardiac surgery. And I think this is the right thing. So they are way other ways to treat a lot of um, um, diseases interventionally with lower risk than in, in cardiac surgery. So, um, we, so we're not that, uh, that experienced in a high number and that's also what's reflected in, in the studies. So it's really, it's a very low patient number that what we see in, these, in, in, in our hospital and I think in the other hospitals as well. Okay. Perhaps a question may I ask you, Professor Kreimbild? Um, I wonder what you, uh, you showed us uh, on NOAX uh, that you can uh, stop or uh, stop these drugs before you provide this. Are you allowed to give these drugs, NOAX, to this very sick population? So, uh, before a drug can uh, enter the market, uh, companies have to perform studies in uh, the patients, mm -hmm. and uh, they did that, <clears throat> and uh, I think uh, right now they are contraindicated, uh, because you have, uh, you see the, the NOx when you, when you look at um, Dabigatran, it's eliminated completely by the kidney, and uh, you have seen that it's difficult to estimate the kidney function in patients with liver cirrhosis. It's more, it's more complicated than you would think. And then um, the uh, rivaroxaban and apixaban, they are uh, eliminated by two thirds by the liver and by CYPCA4 and one third by the kidney. And uh, this is um, quite difficult. So you're going to have longer half-lives in these patients. And you, we do not monitor uh, the state of coagulation. And if you have a patient with uh, atrial fibrillation, you want to give oral anticoagulation, I would propose to, to use uh, the coumarins, where we uh, assess the INR. And I, I consider it as too dangerous to, to use uh, the NOx without monitoring uh, what you do. I don't know what the hepatologists say, but uh, this is this, the standpoint of a clinical pharmacologist and internist. I mean, this is being studied now, um, especially rivaroxaban in patients with liver cirrhosis and portal vein thrombosis. But um, I mean, safety data is still open. Um, we, see very, we see very few patients. It's, uh, the, the ones that I mentioned are those, you know, that come for a workup for liver disease which undergo liver biopsy, it's not necessary that patients with cirrhosis come for biopsy on a NOAX. I just want to make the, uh, to distinguish. Okay. Other questions, other comments? We need to use the chance to ask the experts. How do you, uh, if you go for the MLD, if the patients, are, and this is quite an important number of patients who are on NOx, how do we judge uh, the creatinine or the uh, creatinine level or the um, or the INR level? That is a, a huge problem. It, I don't know how to judge the INR on uh, NOx, and uh, on the other hand, it's part of a a score. Do we need to stop it? Uh, okay, there is uh, the relationship between uh, the plasma concentration of the NOx and the INR is not linear. 
And so uh, you cannot, it's, uh, there is not a fixed uh, relationship to that. Uh, you know that a patient uh, who uh, is on the rivaroxaban or apixaban, when the patient is at the peak, uh, the patient has about the INR between 1.5 and 2. And, but you cannot use that. It's, uh, it doesn't tell you, it tells you that, that the patient has ingested the, the NOAC, but you do actually not know exactly where the patient is with his anticoagulation. And so um, this is one of the reasons that I, uh, I'm in favor of uh, using something that you can monitor. Okay. Thank you very much. Again, in these patients, serotex, we don't have many on NOACs yet, and uh, the MELS group wouldn't work for these patients, but uh, in patients that are on, on Coumadin, for instance, we use also albumin, which is uh, a good parameter that reflects liver synthetic function as, as another marker that will help, help to decide on uh, compensation. But a, a practical question, just a patient on AFib with uh, two stands in the LAD, what is the, uh, what is the best anticoagulation treatment for this patient? As I, you see, um, clinical pharmacologists like to measure, and they want to know what, what they do. And uh, so I would, do, I would take something that you can monitor. And it's clear uh, there are algorithms. Uh, one is from San Gallen, how to start uh, uh, fan Pokemon, for instance, in patients with impaired liver function. That means, uh, of course, you cannot start as in other patients. You have to do that very carefully, but at least you can, you can monitor it. And with the NOx, uh, we don't know how to do that. Unless you measure, always measure uh, the factor 10, but uh, it's, uh, we, we actually, we, we don't, of course, we can measure it, but uh, we do, the interpretation is difficult. And uh, as long as we do not have good numbers, I think we should not do it. Let's uh, go for practical terms to two practical, very uh, practical questions. If you go and have these patients with hypertension um, and liver dysfunction, should we add now a high dose uh, of uh, calcium antagonists to lower blood pressure, or should we um, just say a, a site of, uh, and to keep a calcium antagonist outside? Um, <clears throat> as I told you, the, uh, the calcium antagonist with the lowest burden potential burden of problems is going to be amlodipine because it has the highest bioavailability. And there, um, it's only clearance and uh, what, what matters, and you start with the lowest dose and you look what happens in the patient. With the other ones, um, the, the problem is that you can have a very high bio bioavailability and you may have at a huge concentration that you, not, you would not like to have. So uh, my first thing would, uh, if a calcium antagonist, then you use uh, amlodipine. And um, the ACE inhibitors and the ARPs, I told you, it's, um, I would not use them in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So with high MEL scores or uh, with high child scores, because uh, there it is established that the patients can decompensate. But in a patient with a child A cirrhosis, I'm, I'm still um, old fashioned child A uh, cirrhosis, uh, uh, who is compensated, uh, you can use them. How is it, uh, if I may ask, uh, with statins? Is your opinion that uh, the prognosis of uh, real liver disease is so bad no. that it's anyhow of no use, or uh, not, should not, we treat Not in them? patients with child A, uh, certainly not. You have seen that the prognosis is actually still quite good. And um, <clears throat> I think um, we do not know enough about the statins, but um, there are many patients with liver cirrhosis on statins. What I would do is uh, you must know exactly the aim that you want to treat on, you see, you must know. 
uh, I would like to have this LDL uh, cholesterol concentration, and then you use the lowest dose of a statin to reach this concentration. You just have to know what, what you do, and then I think it's okay. And it may be that uh, the patients may have more muscular problems. You have to tell this the patient, and you have to tell him, come back when you have that, that you can check uh, the medication. Maybe if I can add. So there's um, new data now coming out. It was uh, presented at the annual meeting in London two months ago. So uh, statins in cirrhotics um, are also lowering both hypertension. This has been shown in animal models, but now um, a group in Barcelona also measured HVPG pressures in these patients and also showed that these patients have less uh, bleeding from varices. Um, these studies were done with simvastatin. So usually they start with 10 milligrams. So this is certainly a benefit in these patients. Okay. Last question goes to you. Um, when are you getting wrinkles on your face when you get uh, a patient with what kind of uh, MLD score? 20 uh, points or? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, we discuss it with our hepatologists, so, and we discuss it in the heart team, and, and it's sometimes it's, or it's, it's rare, but uh, I think the, the chance of surviving must be um, more, more than, let's say, a 70% chance to die. So this is uh, not what we are going to do and to operate on. Mm -hmm. So um, then I would go for, for other opportunities, let's say less invasive um, opportunities. So we're really not stacking on this. So what we don't want to have is a, a patient really with the highest risk for, for dying. So uh, we will ref I think we will refuse these high high-risk patients, and even the, and the survival is not predicted, let's say, by also not by the surgery, but also by, by the liver disease, so that's a big point. Um, just adding to your comment, I mean, there is, Mayo Clinic um, looked back at um, patients and underwent different kinds of uh, operations and all were cirrhotics, more than 10,000 patients, and they established a exact score, including MELD, age, and ASA classification. And you can punch in on, on the Mayo Clinic website these three parameters, and you, you will get one week, one month, and three month survival probability undergoing major surgery, big thoracic surgery, abdominal surgery. So this has been very well um, established. If you Google Mayo Clinic MELD score, you will land on this website. Thank you very much, indeed. Final question to Dr. Meyer. Can you summarize what you take home out of this uh, session? For the practical cardiologist. So I think regarding my presentation, the most uh, important message is to be aware that um, patients with um, liver cirrhosis may have several um, cardiac abnormalities, and uh, the most important ones, I think, are uh, diastolic dysfunction, the uh, impaired cardiac response to stress, and this is very important because this explains why these patients do not tolerate well um, an infection, for example, severe, sudden anemia, for example, and there are also some other features that uh, we should be aware of like the prolonged QT. So I think from my presentation, this would be the main uh, messages for the cardiologist. Okay. Any other questions or comments to the speakers, to the chairmen? If not, I thank you for your interest.